Hello Netflix nerds, my name is Derek and welcome to the Netflix Know How, the movie review show here to help you stop browsing and start watching. Today we are going to be taking a look at the apocalyptic dark comedy Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, the minimalistic thriller Creep, and the archaeological documentary Cave of Forgotten Dreams. So grab something cushy for your tushy and let's jump on into the Netflix verse. First up is Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, a comedy film directed by Laureen Scafaria and starring Steve Carell and Kira Knightley. The Netflix synopsis reads, As an asteroid hurtles toward Earth, a man sets out to reunite with his high school sweetheart, but a woman who tags along complicates things. Because apparently an asteroid hurtling towards Earth isn't complicating things enough. Seeking a Friend for the End of the World is a quirky little dark comedy that makes hilarious use of its premise, even if the end result is a little bit too safe for its own good. The aforementioned End of the World is really just a vague backdrop put into place to explore the characters' various coping mechanisms in their final days on Earth. They've got everything covered, from raging drunks, hedonistic partiers, and rioting anarchists, all the way down to suicidal depressives and blissfully ignorant citizens who are more than happy to carry on with their daily lives as usual. Mostly though, I got quite a laugh out of watching the structure of society continue to chug along like normal, even as the world around it was quickly approaching its expiration date. Our main hero, played by Steve Carell, is a man whose life has been spiraling downward long before the apocalypse reared its head, and his entire philosophy on life seems to be, meh, what's the point? He's kind of a Debbie Downer, but you know what? I sort of love the guy. A lot of that has to do with the immensely likable Steve Carell, who gives a very grounded and touching performance, and it's hilarious watching this character wander through the absurdity going around him as everything crumbles apart. While everyone else seems to be frantically running around trying to make sense of their eminent doom, he appears to have begrudgingly accepted his fate as though it couldn't possibly come soon enough. Kira Knightley plays a loose cannon of a woman that inadvertently turns Steve Carell's life into an emotional hurricane, and together they embark on a journey for what they hope will be their final moments of happiness. So over the course of this film, they're supposed to be developing romantic feelings for each other, and I have to be honest, I did not sense even the slightest amount of chemistry between them. I don't necessarily think that's the actor's fault, I think they did a really good job, but I think it's more to do with the way that the story and characters are actually handled in the script. The film sort of treats it like a relationship between two close friends, which I really enjoyed because, personally, I think romances are a little overdone and way too easy to fall into. So when we get to a scene in the movie where Steve Carell has that epiphany moment of, oh my gosh, I love this woman, it just does not fit with the relationship that had been established before that. It didn't ruin the movie by any means, but it did change the dynamic in such a way that I feel like it really lessens the emotional impact. All of a sudden, things just felt very safe and cliché. There is a beautiful scene toward the end where they come across a line of people heading toward the beach, and they spend the day just enjoying the scenery and the company of those around them. That really struck a chord with me, because life is about moments. It's about the experiences and the people that make you happy that are right in front of you. Remembering the past can be great, but it's a trap to try and go back and relive it. As the saying goes, live every day like it's your last, and it's a sentiment that I think this film encapsulates incredibly well. The film was so close to sticking the ending too, but it unfortunately suffers from a case of unintentional multiple endings. It's not as bad as in some films, but it definitely has that scene, that moment where you're expecting the movie to cut to black. But nope, it keeps on going after that. I guess they decided to go with the more schmaltzy ending, which is fine, it makes sense, there's nothing wrong with it, but it definitely was not as powerful as the moment that preceded it. Seeking a friend for the end of the world might not hit as hard as an asteroid hurtling through space, but it's still a funny, sweet, and touching movie that I think is definitely worth sharing with your friends over a movie night. Thumbs up. Next up is Creep a thriller film directed by and starring Patrick Bryce, and also starring Mark Duplass. The Netflix synopsis reads, When a cash-strapped videographer takes a job in a remote mountain town, he finds that the client has some unsettling ideas in mind. No, not those kinds of ideas. That's why we have Pornhub. So yeah, as the title would imply, Creep is about, well, a creep. 
The film focuses on a strange man named Joseph who claims to be dying of a brain tumor and he hires a cameraman to create a video diary for his unborn son to watch after his death. At least, that's what he wants you to believe. Right away you can tell that something is just a little bit off about this guy. From his strange obsession with giving uncomfortable hugs, to his compulsion to jump out and scare the cameraman at every opportunity, something just doesn't feel right about this Joseph character. I really like that he is initially presented as just sort of an eccentric weirdo with some odd quirks. We can't really tell if he's just some harmless dude with a weird personality, or if he's genuinely some kind of psychopath who's barely holding his sanity together. That uneasiness really creates a wonderful current of tension throughout the film, and it only grows stronger and more palpable as the film progresses. The suspenseful buildup between Joseph and the cameraman is also handled amazingly well. The cameraman essentially acts as a voyeur for us to witness the madness of Joseph as he slowly becomes more and more unhinged over the course of the movie. One of the most nerve-wracking scenes in the movies happens when the cameraman is invited into Joseph's house, and he later finds out that his keys have gone missing and Joseph won't let him leave. It basically feels like the walls are closing in around him as something ominous approaches, and I was nearly squirming in my seat by the time events in the house come to a truly disturbing head. There's also some clever use of editing and transitions that really help to escalate the tension. The movie will transition from one scene to the next and imply that a certain something has happened, but then it will pull us back and it will completely change the context, which puts the things that we watched before in a totally new perspective. On top of that, there are some wonderfully dark and creepy shots. The highlight is easily a shot where we are looking up at Joseph while he is lit from behind, and the entire front side of him is just cloaked in silhouette. It's like staring up at the Grim Reaper and it's oh so chilling. With such a good buildup of tension, it's kind of a shame that the story isn't particularly original. At the end of the day, it's really just a creepy stalker movie about a creepy psychopath who does some really horrible things because he's not right in the head. And I also think the cameraman was a bit of a dumb donut. About halfway through the film, Joseph starts pulling some real creepy stalker tactics on the cameraman. Now, I will admit, the cameraman does go to the police initially, and he doesn't have any success with that. But as things start to escalate and the evidence starts to pile up, I don't understand why he wouldn't go to the police again. Clearly, he can prove something now. Seems to me like he was just asking for a bad time. And the film is shot in the found footage style, so as I've said before, if that is not your thing, you might not get much enjoyment out of this. Creep may not be the most original stalker psychopath movie that I've ever seen, but it is certainly a highly effective one that does capture a strong sense of looming panic and dread. Creeped me out real good. Thumbs up. Finally, we have Cave of Forgotten Dreams, a documentary film directed by Werner Herzog. The Netflix synopsis reads, This fascinating documentary offers an unprecedented look at France's Chauvet Cave, which contains the oldest human painted images found on Earth. <sighs> wow. Cave of Forgotten Dreams is an absolutely beautiful and fascinating documentary about a place that can only be described as pure magic. The cave itself is a wonder to look at. From the sparkling surfaces and polished contours to the towering stalactites and winding mineral deposits, Everything in this cave is an absolute feast for the eyes. I am actually fortunate enough to live near a cave that does allow tours inside of it. Hashtag Cave of the Winds. Go check it out. And I have to say that witnessing a naturally formed cave in person is a vastly different experience than seeing it on film. Thankfully, I think that this film does an excellent job of capturing that sense of wonder on camera, which is a very good thing because the cave itself is actually closed off to the public. Caves are a very delicate ecosystem after all. Don't want silly humans coming around and messing the whole place up. But of course, the main point of interest here is the paintings, and boy oh boy do they deliver. Upon first seeing them, it seems impossible to believe that these paintings are tens of thousands of years old, with many dating back to a time when Neanderthals still roamed the land. It's as if they were painted just a few days before the actual expedition. That's how pristine they are and the sheer amount of detail and artistic expressiveness that is contained within them is something that reaches out and touches your very soul. Seeing these paintings and learning about the history behind them is honestly something like a journey of true enlightenment. 
I may be a staunch atheist, but this is about as close as it gets to a spiritual experience for me. The film overall has a very reflective, philosophical, and meditative mood about it as well. Werner Herzog's raspy, relaxed narration creates a soothing atmosphere that perfectly captures that sense of wonder and peace that the cave emanates. It's not just a film about the cave and its paintings, it's about finding the greater meaning within them. It's a movie about what it means to be human. The film does suffer somewhat from what can feel like a very slow pace, which isn't so much a pitfall as it is a matter of personal preference. I will say that I can have an immense amount of patience for a movie if the subject matter is intriguing enough, and there is absolutely no doubt that Chauvet Cave is an immensely engaging subject. Still, there were a few moments, especially toward the end, where it felt like the pace slowed to a snail's crawl, and I did find myself nodding off just a little bit here and there. Maybe it's because I was laying on my really big comfy pillow, but I definitely did get the sense that every time I came around, I really hadn't missed that much. Slow pace aside, this is nothing short of a mystical journey into a captivating piece of forgotten human history. For all of the amazing, fantastical worlds that we see in the movies, or read about in books, or even experience in our own dreams, we should never ever forget the very real and very enchanting spectacle of the world that exists beneath our feet. Thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching, I appreciate every single one of you. If you've seen these movies, feel free to leave a comment below, I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on them. Also, if you have any suggestions for movies, please feel free to comment them and maybe I'll feature them in an episode in the future. Uh, so I know I'm sounding like a broken record by this point, but Twitter is coming, I promise. In the meantime, you can always head over to Facebook, you can like and follow me on there, I post all my updates about the show and everything on there. And yeah, that's all I have for you today. Hopefully you found something interesting that maybe you could check out over the next week. And as always, if you want to know your flicks, you know where to click. Yes, nailed it. <laughs> See you next week guys, happy hunting.